So this should work out for everyone. Um, everything should be embedded here and, and work okay without the webcam. Um, hopefully you got a copy of um, the Intellectual Freedom Handout um, that I posted on the handouts uh, tab of the discussion forum. Did everybody have a chance to locate it? It's uh, pink, blue, and yellow. Yeah, got it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so for my presentation, this is sort of a pre-service workshop in um, June or August for other school librarians. Um, so sort of like a job alike. I don't know if you do that in your district where we would all be librarians coming together. Um, it is on intellectual freedom, um, just like the previous one, um, just with a slightly different take on who the intended audience is. Um, and so um, my topic is Our Right to Read. That is the name of uh, the 2017 Band Looks uh, theme. And so we're going to be talking about intellectual freedom, um, really with the standpoint of how to teach the teachers at your school about intellectual freedom and how to um, include student voice in all of your intellectual freedom lessons in the library and band books week um, so that we can see that it's meaningful and not maybe as dry. Um, so just a background, I know we're all librarians and I know we all know. Um, on your handout um, in that pink space in the middle, uh, you've got uh, some space to write a two sentence, sort of your own definition of what intellectual freedom means to you. If you could pretend to record that on your handout, that'd be awesome. And in our pretend world where we're all sitting in desks, you would now discuss with your elbow partner. And you're going to develop a shared definition with yourself and your elbow partner that's one sentence long, um, which is what you're going to do here for me. So if you have your cell phone, awesome. If not, you can toggle over to a new tab to use um, Pull Everywhere. But you text that number uh, 37607. Um, and then the message is my account, Heather Rowan, 408. And then you can type a one sentence definition of intellectual freedom and it'll populate all of our definitions up on here. So if you could do that for me, that would be awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, and if you want to add your name like Lindsay did so we can see who's participating, that's also awesome. All right, it's, it's a little fun to uh, get a hang of uh, Poll Everywhere. Um, I don't know if anybody's used Socrative in the classroom. I like Poll Everywhere a little bit better um, because you don't have to download a special app. Fantastic, right to information. Um, I'm not sure if that's everyone or not. Great access in the information. So that's going to cover, you know, internet access as well. Right, definitely the First Amendment. All right, is that everybody? Is anybody still struggling with um, logging in or typing on their phone really quickly? I don't want to cut anybody off at the knees. All right, so those are some great definitions. Um, if you if you had your handout on you in our pretend world, fantastic. Um, right to speed, uh, read, speak, access, and learn whatever you want. Right, so that emphasis on on learning. Um, so if you had your handout in the pink box, there's a space for your last uh, shrinking summary where you would define um, intellectual freedom in seven words or fewer. So we're going to pretend that we're writing there on our handout um, based on, on all that awesomeness, sorry, of the previous screen. So incorporating sort of everybody's ideas together to come up with the best uh, seven, set, or seven word 
a phrase or sentence that you could. Right, so as the previous group said, a lot of, of where we tend to see intellectual freedom detailed is in our collection policy. Um, so most collection policies are going to quote a combination um, of this ALA definition, right? It's, so it's originating in the Library Bill of Rights, and you've got some space on your handout to fill in the blanks. Um, the idea that a person's right to use a library should not be changed, it should not be affected because of where they're from, their age, background, or views. On the age has been a real stickler, right? Minors were not covered by the Library Bill of Rights in its earliest editions. There were a lot of legal cases, that we'll talk about in a second, that established those for us. Um, and the way they interpret that for our school libraries is that only parents and guardians have right to dictate what their children can or cannot read, and it really only pertains to their children, not to other children. Um, the State Board of Education in Texas has their own version that a lot of people include in their collection policy as well. But they're all sort of permutations of this ALA interpretation. Um, and this is something that's really, really relevant um, now, certainly because of things like WikiLeaks and the idea that I should be able to access information if I elect to and where the government comes, um, you know, in between me and the access to information that I might like. Um, so since our goal here is to talk about why we want to talk to our colleagues who may not know as much uh, as we do about intellectual freedom and First Amendment free speech rights. Um, basically, thanks to the cases, the legal cases that protect our rights, uh, an ability to recommend books to minors without fear of uh, firing or other legal reproduction or repercussions. It, it covers the teachers too. So they also have the freedom um, to recommend books to students with, in good conscience without worrying about that. But potential conflict with administrators can lead to self-censorship and teachers are really on the front line, right? Um, they're seeing the kids every day. They're seeing parents on a much more regular basis than us. So a lot of times they're a lot more tentative about what they are including on reading lists or in their classroom library. Um, so it's really important for us to support them and help them understand how they're protected and how we can help them if a parent starts to complain. So when we're discussing with our teachers um, about this, and there's some links to different resources um, on your handout. And we want to talk to them about the limitations of classroom libraries, um, which often uh, tend to be highly influenced by the teacher's personal taste. We lack um, a sense of multiculturality, diversity, um, and gender and sexual orientation representation. Uh, they may shy away from controversial topics for the reasons we just discussed. Right? They don't want to offend those parents. They don't want to damage that close relationship that they need so they can educate children every day. And um, then maybe, maybe pretty narrow when it comes to reading levels, right? An individual second grade or sixth grade teacher is not going to necessarily have everything from K to 12 covered just because she has some low level or some high level kids. Um, Lexile limited reading programs, right? May be appropriate within curriculum, um, but they're not something that we choose to govern and we specifically choose not to govern them uh, in the library. And this is where you want to get into the difference between reading within the curriculum and the recreational reading. So if students are checking out books from a classroom library or a school library for um, silent sustained reading or drop everything and read or some kind of self-selected reading, it's important to let the child choose, even if it's maybe not the Lexile level you would prefer, um, because we're trying to help students learn how to enjoy reading and develop a sense of individual taste. And if we're, we're governing, oh, we can only read realistic fiction and, oh, you need to read something that's, you know, seventh grade or higher because you read at a seventh grade reading level, uh, then we're impeding a student's identity, a formation of identity as a reader. And we are engaging in a little bit of censorship there. Um, so I have some programming ideas, right, because we're all librarians and we want to do more um, with kids in our classroom. So to touch on those legal cases that I discussed, um, my suggestion would be to have a class discussion or a small group discussion activity and to use a back channeling app like Today's Meet, uh, which is great. It allows for multiple simultaneous discussion threads. Uh, there's no shouting, so everyone can be polite. You can project it up on a screen so everyone can see all the 
conversations going on at once. Um, and it really helps those shyer, more withdrawn students have the confidence to participate. So some cases you might bring up to your kids um, were uh, a couple of kids in California who wore US flag shirts on Mexican American Pride Day and their uh, principal required them to change. Uh, Tinker versus Des Moines I, uh, CISD. Uh, so this is an old case from the 60s where um, some students wore black armbands to school to protest our involvement in the Vietnam War. Uh, the principal sent them home and the courts decided that uh, free speech did not end at the school doors. It was a really seminal case in when it comes to students' free speech rights. Um, SJW versus Lee Summit School District. So these were two brothers who ran a blog in which, among other things, they complained or vented about their school experience and made fun of some of their classmates. Um, and they did this on school computers as well as personal computers. And the school argued that it was disruptive, especially when the students being mocked found out. Um, the lower court sided with the school, but an appellate court went the other direction. Um, and lastly, we've got the really foundational case of the Board of Education versus PICO. So uh, this was the one that decided schools just couldn't remove books without a formal challenge process because they didn't match the values or were plain filthy in their words. I um, mean, you've got a link to the biography of uh, Everett T. Moore, um, who was an early champion for teachers and librarians' rights to recommend uh, books to juveniles. Um, and it, it goes into more detail on that. Um, does anybody have any other, I, I know that some of us may have like a social studies background, does anybody else have any other sort of legal precedents that you're aware of or you have used when discussing uh, free speech or First Amendment rights with students? Nope. Okay, well, we'll move on then. Um, so this is this year's poster for um, Banned Books Week, um, and it is sponsored in part by the Freedom to Read Foundation, which uh, Everett Moore was a, a co-founder of. So our, our next topic is going to be censorship. So you can respond as many times as you'd like to this, and it says, which of the following things constitute censorship? If you could whip out your cell phones again, that would be amazing. For sure, um, Harry Potter in particular was subjected to this quite often, as was Twilight. Um, yeah, removing the title. So removing a title before challenge process, uh, I Am Jazz, uh, and other books uh, depicting uh, teen sexuality tend to do that. Keeping a controversial book in a drawer, this is the fate of uh, and Tango makes three. Limiting checkouts by reading levels, so that's where we were talking about Hunger Games. Um, happens a lot with Hunger Games and Twilight. Um, parent signature is an interesting one. This tends to be the way that um, a lot of middle schools manage their, their checkouts of like Lone Star books, or elementary schools manage their checkouts of the, G, the J level Blue Bonnet books that maybe teachers or librarians think are a little too grown up for their kids. So, but we agree, right? These are all censorship. But all librarians are not on the same page as us, which is, uh, has been a little surprising, um, maybe startling to me, probably not um, to everyone if you've, if you've worked in a bunch of different school districts. Um, I may just work in a little more of an open school district when it comes to intellectual freedom. Um, we're gonna move on here. Thanks, guys. Okay, so um, on your handout, um, it, it gives you a little bit of space uh, to write down which uh, form of censorship previously described, right, on this page, so in that blank space, you'd write down which one you think it would surprise the teachers uh, at your school the most, right? Just because we know those things are censorship doesn't mean all of the teachers at our school are going to agree that censorship. So are there any there that you think um, the teachers at your school might not consider censorship? I think a lot of them are going to think that the parent signature or permission is 
um, you know, just being careful, and I don't think they would consider it censorship in a lot of cases. Okay, good point. I think uh, that's, the, that, that's actually the one that I, I also would agree that I, I personally wouldn't think, I feel like that's a way of allowing a book to stay on the shelf. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that's one that I know a lot of people wouldn't see as being censorship because you're still allowing it, you're just asking for permission. I think limiting checkouts by reading level or grade level is one that people may not see as censorship because a kindergartner is not going to be reading a fifth grade level book um, anyway. So maybe they wouldn't see it as anything other than just making common sense. I agree with that one as well. I know I have seen um, that happen in my library. A kindergartner tries wants to have a big heavy book in their hand that they take home and there's no way that kid's going to be able to read that book. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen that for sure. And I, I can see teachers and librarians not really considering that censorship. Well, right. And I, I can definitely see your point there because you're, you're less doing it about that particular title than like the child cannot demonstrate they can read that book on their own. But then again, like you never know, like maybe mom reads a giant chapter book to them every night when they go to bed, even though they're seven. Um, so it may or may not, sort of depending on, on whether or not the child was going to be able to use that book in any way, or if it was just, um, just a thing. But I know, like, for instance, when I was a child, um, they didn't allow children, like upstairs into the adult section, children were allowed to check out books uh, from the adult section until they were 12. And the public library definitely did not think that was censorship, that they wouldn't let 10-year-olds check out adult nonfiction or what have you. Um, so my, my thoughts, though, on requiring parent signature for some books, um, if you set that as a barrier, like not every child um, is going to be able to get that parent signature, right? Because some parents would require to read the book first. And it also sort of really communicates your values to the parent that there is something they should be concerned about in that book. And just because it has, you know, a J uh, sticker on it or a YA sticker on it, depending on what school you're at, you and the school are, are you know, making a, a value judgment about that book that you're communicating to the parents, whether you've decided to do so or not. Um, I have a and situation at my school with letter E, but I'm just wanting to get other people's opinion on what our librarian does. Um, kindergartners are not allowed to check out books or bring them home unless they have a parent signature form, which I obviously do not agree with, but that is what happens. That's really sad. What's the, what's the rationale for that? That I, I don't agree with that at all, but is it... They lose them that's or all, what? That they want, that they're not responsible enough. So they can check certain ones out, but they cannot take them home. They have so to they have can a use letter from their parents. Sorry, what? So is that like maybe like a fiscal responsibility thing where the school doesn't want to put parents on the hook for like Tommy spilling juice all over a book and that's why he's only allowed to use it at school? That That is what our librarian says, but we also have a lot of D going on um, in my library where they're not allowed to check out certain books. I assume that first graders are allowed to take books home, though? It's kindergartner. They are allowed to take them home, but they cannot, uh, only if they have the parent signature. If they don't have the parent signature, they have to either just look at look books in the library or up to teacher discretion, they can keep them in the classroom. Kindergartners okay. are not allowed to uh, take books home at my library either, and it's not even like a parent signature thing. They're just not allowed to take them home. Um, I'm I, I don't I don't think the librarian has had any parents ask to sign a permission slip and allow their kid to take the book home. But as far as I know, I mean it was it was kind of a decision between the kindergarten teachers themselves and um, and the librarian. Um, yeah, I'm at a very low income school and a lot of those kids do lose the books and then they can't pay for them. So they just don't, because of their responsibility thing, they don't allow the kindergartners to take them home. Yeah, our, our campus has the same thing. So basically um, the librarian meets with the teachers and sends out letters so that parents can check them out. Um, so that way the students don't have access, but through parent checkout. 
that seems to be putting an extra barrier between children want, wanting a book and being able to have the time to read it if their parents have to set foot on campus to check it out. Well, not all parents have times. So I also work in low-income schools, and a lot of my parents wouldn't have the time to come in and do that. And, and I do understand that younger students are maybe less responsible because they're scatty, but um, nothing changes between the last week of kindergarten and the first week of first grade that makes them more responsible. They need to learn. They need an opportunity. It, I completely like agree. those librarians are missing a, a tremendous opportunity to build readers. You know, kindergartens, kindergartners are very interested in the library. They're interested in books. You're training them how to take care of them. And I can see not letting them take, you know, a whole stack of things so that they're likely to lose them. But um, I think probably the number of books lost versus the, the um, disadvantage that you're doing to those kids. I, I don't support that rule. I've experienced a couple of librarians who are, the only kind way to say it is they are very close to retirement and they are done with the job. <laughs> And they are, they're done. They're done with the job. They're done with giving second chances. So I wonder if it's maybe this, these librarians making these decisions um, need some fresh opinions, um, maybe some, some younger or newer librarians to encourage them. The librarian at my school is actually not older. Um, she's mid-30s. I think she's been teaching about 15 or taught for three years and has been a librarian for 12 the other thing, and I don't know if this is considered censorship, it kind of goes with E, is that if a kid doesn't return their book, they're not allowed to check one out for the rest of the year. Oh. And she was making them sit out at recess, and our principal found out about that and put a stop to that rule. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. We really need I'm trying to take to her thought. about intellectual freedom. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I, I heard that if you have, I think it's, it was 10%, if you have 10% of your books each year that you're either um, lost, stolen, or ruined, that you should uh, consider yourself a successful librarian because that means <laughs> that the students are reading. Um, you know, if the books never disappear or are never ruined, then that means no one's using them. Exactly. Like, our job is not to be, like, the zookeepers of, like, the most immaculate children's books in the Western world. It's just not... Uh, I mean, and maybe this is, I work at a pretty low-income library, so when we buy children's books, we don't usually buy hardcover. Like, I know I see a lot of people discussing, like, what level of binding do you get so the book lasts forever? Like, the book does not need to last forever. Like, I don't care what it is. Um, if it's a children's book and it's going to get lost and you went $25 deep into that book, that was your fault not thinking about how it would be used. You can buy those books paperback for $6 and they will endure 15 checkouts. Um, when it comes to like teen chapter books, by the time the covers start to look super out of date and 80s-licious, the, the teenagers are not going to keep checking them out. They do not want your 1970 copy of like Island of the Blue Dolphins because <laughs> it does. It looks boring to them. So if we get in a situation where we invest so much money in the collection that we can't stand to lose books, or we feel like we always have to replace every book that was lost, even if it wasn't circulating heavily. We put kids um, in the district I taught in, we put kids on the hook for library books for their entire educational career until they move to a new school. So if you lost a book in kindergarten, your parents owed that money till fifth grade. Um, and that's a really big deal for um, you know, those low-income parents that a lot of us work with. And I get um, not wanting to put those parents on the hook for the cost of whatever books their their kids might lose, but I think that solution of like really limiting uh, K checkouts to like two or five or whatever books at a time could go a long way to solving that um, because I just think that disadvantages like struggling readers or delighted readers so much to not be able to have access to those own, like especially kids who may not be able to get books in other ways. But it also sort of raises the question like, the kid couldn't get a library card at a public library without their parents. So if you're not signing some kind of financial agreement with the kid's parents in their like first day of school packet among all the other forms they fill out, the parent shouldn't suddenly be on the hook financially for like every book a kid's ever checked out without you even making that agreement with them in, in my point of view.
Mm -hmm. I think what they're doing in my is in my district um, is at the, the if they do lose a book, you know, a bill is sent home repeatedly. Eventually, it's usually written off when you know the families aren't going to pay it. But um, if they owe, you know, upwards of fifty, sixty, seventy dollars, we hold their end of year report card. They can't get it until something, even a, a negligible amount has been paid towards it, even if it's just $5 or the parent comes in at least to be face to face to kind of talk to the librarian about being responsible with the books. And then the debt is usually just written off when they get their report card. I like that. I mean, I like the idea of having some kind of like book stewardship class, kind of like defensive driving that you might make a kid sit through if they had racked up um, X amount of money in, in, in lost books because I just, having a kid never be able to check out a book again because they lost a book in first grade that their parents can't pay for is really the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right. And even though it's maybe not explicit censorship, it sure has the same long-term effect. My librarian, for kids who can't pay, if, um, if they have just outright said, I'm not going to be able to pay this fine, I really want to check out, my librarian will let kids come in and do like some volunteer work in the library. And it, it just depends on the ability level of that kid. Um, it might be cleaning off the covers or, you know, picking up trash or, you know, doing whatever. We have a garden off of our library going and doing something in the garden, but she finds things for them to do to kind of like work off that fine, which I really enjoy that. Mm. My mentor librarian does the same thing and I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, that's stellar. Like all of those are great suggestions. Like that's definitely the kind of attitude we need to have towards lost books. We don't need to be like treating kids like they're criminals at age six because, you know, they sat on something or lost it or spilled something on it. And so much of their lives is out of their control. That right. book probably wasn't lost because of anything to do with them. Exactly. So it, it just, you know, and that, that breaks our relationship with the child. Who knows that that's objective reality, right? It's not their fault. Mom left it behind at grandma's and grandma's not going to be able to mail it you know, to them or, you know, whatever has potentially happened to it, but we're acting as though they're like fully autonomous adults who have that much power over every day. So that's a great point. All right. Um, so our ALA definition of censorship, after that amazing discussion of what's going on in our school libraries. Um, so censorship really and this is why I made it the blank, it's a change in the access status. If you had a book and people started like looking a little bit scant at it and you make it parental signature required or you make it eighth grade shelf only, then that counts as censorship because it's a change in the access status. Um, and age and grade level challenges, uh, changes are absolutely part of that. Um, you've got some censorship uh, resources to um, the ALA. I've included a couple articles. The Eric Digest article is super old. It's from 1990, but it is really great, um, and it talks about that sort of more subconscious uh, censorship. The School Library Journal one is also about self-censorship, right, and um, the previous group talked about that, like, largely being related um, to language, the standard of what inappropriate language is just varies so wildly um, from age level to age level community, community, and also in the state of Texas, anything that refers to gender identity, sexual orientation, or um, romantic gender preference is, is pretty much seen as, you know, way, way above um, what's appropriate for young children, regardless of, of whether or not it applies to them or not. Um, so one of the things I wanted to introduce is, is how we have that discussion with our colleagues, um, because it is not unusual for an elementary school, especially lower elementary school teacher, to ask, like, hey, I want you to keep my kids, you know, in the E1 section, or I want to make sure that, you're, that nobody is checking out I am jazz, because I don't want to hear from those parents, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this is a, a school librarian. Um, she is a uh, elementary school librarian. Um, and we talked about how she handles uh, censorship. So she gets way out in front at the beginning of the year when she introduces herself to all her new colleagues. Um, she sends a school-wide email. She uh, says that she includes the district's policy on 
um, the fact the district can't just remove a book because somebody like, doesn't like it. Um, she details their formal um, process uh, for ch uh, challenging a book. Um, she includes some ALA information on free speech. She includes the Texas Library Association information on free speech. Um, so this really helps teachers who may be worried about whether or not to include a book of story time or on a reading list, um, exactly how they're covered and um, you know what, what it takes if a book's going to be removed, that it's not because they don't like it or a parent doesn't like it, it just sort of instantly vanishes or goes under a rug. So I like that attitude of being upfront um, with your colleagues every year. Um, but we know that there's a lot of pressure on the school librarian herself or himself um, to maybe not buy a particular book. So if you could whip out your phone again and um, let me know who you think creates the lar largest pressure um, to censor when you are uh, displaying or purchasing, uh, adding to your collection. Oh my gosh, so we definitely, we definitely agree um, that it is, it is parents. Obviously, we don't want the parents to make us, um, you know, look bad, for lack of a better word, in front of our administrators, right? Our administrators don't want us to um, have this conflict with the parents. Does anybody want to uh, comment on the, the thing that they chose, why they felt that way? So I chose administrators because, um, I think a lot of admin just don't even want it to be a possibility that a parent is going to be offended. So it's kind of um, avoiding censoring before the problem even arises just to save on the drama. Right. That's, I mean, it's such a tough, tough decision, especially if you've got some funding issues. Your administrator does not want the school library uh, to be the reason the school gets bad PR and angry groups of parents are talking about why you have some salty title on the shelf. So there's definitely no pressure. No one wants attention drawn to their school <laughs> in a negative way. Right, and all it takes is a slow news day at your local news channel, and that could be on the internet, and all of the angry people who love to shout on the internet will find you and come to your virtual doorstep to let you know how they feel about that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge, um, and, and not everybody feels up for it. Um, so my programming idea for discussing censorship is helping students understand what we as librarians go through and the choices that are made behind closed doors about what material is available and accessible to them. Um, so I have um, a Google Doc, that the link to it um, is under programming ideas on your handout. Um, and I've got a little picture of it on the next slide. Uh, so these are statements from real librarians doing what people do and arguing with each other on Facebook. Um, so you would divide up these statements, you'd uh, have each student read their librarian statement, and you'd have a small group discussion about how censorship affected them, how the students felt about censorship, and in response, um, since this is a social media sort of concept, have the students create some kind of social media product uh, PSA, a blog post, a thing like something shareable, right, if you use, I think it's a Jumo, um, that's the educational blogging site, right, that might be a good place for you. Um, so these are names mostly redacted, actual things that people said on Facebook with slight grammar corrections by me. Um, and there's, there's a full page of these. And Watching these people argue on Facebook was really a wake-up call to me because I had hoped, right, this is from um, Future Ready Librarian, so I had hoped people who had self-defined as being future ready would not be uh, trying so hard. And if you look at uh, CW, right, CW wants to put more books on restricted shelves. CW does not like having those dirty books in their library at all. Um, and they, they want to avoid that drama at any cost. And 
it doesn't matter if the book is popular. They are like Wimpy Kid. They are happy to restrict it. That's really a you know an intense personal bias. That's I don't I don't think that that's as common, but I might be wrong about that. I mean, I'm not saying it's common, but there were two posts within a couple of days of each other um, earlier this spring, which um, all said just over 100 school librarians commented on. Um, and I did check people's profiles um, to see that they were currently employed as librarians. So I didn't include anybody who didn't have a job information. Um, a lot of people who want to argue about this are really defensive about their right to decide what's appropriate for kids at their school level. Like I had thought it wasn't as common as it was, but you know, watching people discuss this online has sort of raised my awareness. It's a lot more common than I think we might like to admit, uh -huh. right? And we're not just talking about keeping like pure erotica, like Fifty Shades of Grey out of the library. We're talking about, um, I think the starting uh, post on this one was people uh, arguing about whether or not to have Tango Makes Three in a school library, and the previous one was about whether to uh, remove Little House on the Prairie um, for its racially insensitive comments and depiction of Native American peoples. I mean, I think the thing is, if a, if a book is written for children, with the intention of being for children, we need to allow our children to have access to it. Um, a JP's comment that he just kind of, or she, he or she, just kind of let the issue fade away because it wasn't a formal complaint. I actually kind of agree with, with what he did because sometimes, as we know, parents just want to be heard um, and then don't necessarily want to follow up. They just want to be heard. So, and sometimes you just have to hear them out and then let things naturally disappear. So um, I kind of understand why JP would do that. Um, Oh, absolutely. Like, there's no need to, like, bring extra animosity, right, to that conflict. You, mm. that, that's definitely something you can sort of de-escalate. Mm. The librarian at, um, at my school retired um, several years ago now. It's been, like, four or five years. But she did the same thing that CW did with Diary of a Wimpy Kid didn't like it and so she kept it she had one copy of the first book and she kept it in a drawer and she oh. just didn't even tell anybody oh. that it was available <laughs> and she hated the book she didn't want anybody to check it out and when my librarian came in she realized that and then she immediately went in and bought several copies of all of those books because those are like the number one thing that kids are asking for and exactly. it was ridiculous to think that that they weren't being allowed access to something that they wanted to read. For a librarian to do that just makes me think that they don't understand children at all because it's giving no um, respect to our young readers whatsoever that we think they can't differentiate between what's real and what's not and that if they read something that's a little bit naughty or a little bit cheeky that suddenly they're going to become bad kids and do it. It's, it's just ridiculous. Right, and I'm sure she'd be one of those people who was super offended by Captain Underpants, um, <laughs> like y'all were talking about oh, yeah. earlier, because the no principal Captain. was mean. Right, no, there's no Captain Underpants at this school. I just, I don't understand that person. Like, I don't need to be anybody else's mom. Like, I have infinite respect for the parents of those children and their right to raise their children the way they see fit. I don't need to usurp their role or do it for them and assume that I know how they would wish to parent their children. Because mm. even if even if 85 out of 100 parents do want me to keep Wendy Kid away from their kid, it's not my place to do anything for the remaining, you know, those remaining 15 parents. Like each parent can decide and communicate to their child. And if a kid brings Wimpy Kid home and mom goes ballistic, then kid can bring her right back, right? That's, that's the relationship between mom and their kid, right? My mom was the one who would have gone ballistic but it wasn't my librarian's job to police what my mom thought was going to be okay. I think it's a slightly different matter to say, like, hey, this, you're, you're 12, this is a YA book, it has some pretty mature stuff in it, it's got some sex and violence. Like, think to yourself, like, is this something you feel ready for, and is this something that your parents might be okay with? Like, it might be a discussion you want to have with your parents, but it's not your job to be their parents. 
So I have a question on that topic. Um, like you mentioned the example of a middle schooler that wants to read um, a pretty mature book, YA book. Um, in terms of parents and just them parenting their own child, not trying to interfere with what other students are reading, is there anything that a parent can do um, for their child other than see what's in their backpack? Um, what's the relationship on the elementary middle school um, level between parents and librarians and what their child is reading? I'm just curious because I've always worked in a high school. Holly, I would hope they're not trying to team up and enforce parents' rules. I mean, that would be... Right, it's, I taught in high school, so it wasn't my job to reinforce your dress code for your child. I didn't reinforce the school's dress code. If your child met the school's dress code and you thought wearing pants was a sin against God, like, that is your business with your child. Like, if you want to come to school in first period and see if they changed after they left your car and before they got to school, my door is open, but I'm not going to police your child, right? Your family values are your family values. I okay. think reading a book with your child goes a long way. And if they're a middle schooler or a high schooler, like you might not physically be reading that book to them. But to be reading the same book as your student at the same time and then setting aside some time at home to talk about that book, I think that that can go a long way and kind of allows you to know what your kids are reading and the kind and what they're thinking about what they're reading. Um, and um, to kind of help you to see kind of where they're at um, intellectually and what they should be reading and shouldn't be reading and that kind of thing. Well, that's yeah, a great, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, and it, it really, you also get the benefit of your modeling, right, reading to your child if you're reading sort of in a tiny home-sized book club. All right, anyone else? So we're going to move along. Um, and our last topic is challenges, right? We, we don't want them to happen, um, but if we're doing our job properly, it's possible that they might. Um, and the best way to deal with challenges is to really be prepared in advance. Um, so that means having a really good detailed formal, cha formal challenge policy uh, in your, your selection policy document. If you come from a big school district, it's probably there. Uh, if you come from a charter school or a private school, you may need to update it um, or a really small uh, school district. Um, update your principles on what the challenge process is. So in the case um, of the, the top librarian there, it was her principal who'd asked her to uh, limit the checkout. And so the principal needs to know what's going on and be on board. That way it's not a horrible surprise if a parent comes up. So they understand what's expected of that parent. Right, and so that they can say with just as much confidence when the angry parent tries to get their way just through emails and phone calls and showing up in person that there is a document that has to be filled out, there's a committee that has to meet and they all have to read the work, like there's, there's this whole process. Um, identify your challenge committee, it's really easy. Um, this happened in a school district where I taught, a book was a, a challenge in, um, in the elementary school and they hadn't, the librarians hadn't selected their challenge committee, right? It was very open-ended. It was just teachers, school board members, administrators, but they hadn't gotten people on board and asked individual people specifically if they would be part of the challenge committee. And having those names down sort of allows, in that case, the school board sort of took over and put who they wanted on, um, on the committee and it was weighted very, heavily in favor of the complainant parents, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't the committee that, you know, one would make if one was just being level-headed and wanted the best reviewers for work possible. Um, and lastly, keeping a paper digital copy of the formal complaint, um, the formal challenge form on hand, that way you have something to hand a parent who is upset, um, you know, if you ask them after they express their concerns, if they would like to file a formal complaint, having something to give them or a link you can email them or a link that's on your school's library website um, can make them more satisfied in that transaction that you weren't just sort of leaving them hanging and saying, hey, there's a formal challenge process, go figure it out. I know it may seem um, counterintuitive, right? Because if you hand them the thing they need to get all that mess started, they should be twice as likely to do it. But maybe seeing the, you know, that the form's a little bit imposing 
and feeling like someone took their concerns that seriously um, will be enough to make them feel satisfied. And obviously, you do have that discussion, right? This doesn't just remove the book for your child. You're absolutely, you know, you're absolutely uh, welcome to prevent your child from reading this book. This removes the book from every other child, regardless of what their parents might want, right, without consulting their parents on that and helping sort of put them in the shoes of, of those other parents. Um, this is a sign that um, the teacher I interviewed earlier has in her library. A number of other teachers also said they had this. Um, to sort of help the student understand that a book that is too much for them maybe isn't for them. Not every book is for every reader. Uh, but right there, there's someone who that book means something to going to the school. Right, and that tends to be the really, really big issue with, with the, the gay books that have gay characters or characters with gay parents, right, is the idea a book should be a mirror and parents are horrified sometimes because they feel like it's like precociously sexual to mention that in a picture book or a children's book, but right, we're trying to make sure that there's something for every kid at that school. All right, so to prepare classroom teachers, um, and they're the ones, a lot of times, censorship isn't a parent upset about a book their kid brought home. Um, it's a parent who is aware that there's something new and controversial out. Like right now, it's been 13 reasons this past school year. Um, I know a lot of you guys are in elementary school libraries. Did anybody have 13 reasons go crazy at their school like it did for me? Did anybody watch it on Netflix or read it or anything like that in their own time? I've seen a lot of our students watched it. Elementary school, wow. Or are you a middle school librarian? Sorry, I didn't catch who was talking. Uh, um, sorry, I'm elementary. elementary. We didn't have students watch it. I've heard okay. Of. Sorry, I'm high school, and um, a lot of our students were watching it, and um, some of the teachers got together and were kind of talking about it. Because um, for some of our students, to be honest, um, watching it was kind of triggering for those of them um, that are sensitive to those topics. And so we just got together to talk about how to support the students as they have those discussions. Sure, that's really good. Um, so like I said, that's one way we end up with challenges, right? A parent is aware they've heard from someone else or they've seen this show or whatever, and then they want to make sure that we don't have it in our library so their you know, precious child cannot be exposed to that. Um, another way that challenges arise is um, through assigned reading lists or suggested reading lists, particularly summer reading lists, because a parent has this document and they have a long time to look at it. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't matter to them that 12 of the 15 books have no profanity, nudity, or gay characters. And even though the kid only has to pick one, the fact that there are three on there that have something objectionable is really upsetting to them. So a lot of times, and it's not as best as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not technically censorship to remove something from a suggested reading list, right? Because the ability to access the material hasn't changed in any way, but that tends to be what, um, that tends to be how books become challenged, is people just want them off the reading list. They don't want it to seem like the school is acknowledging or promoting any content they might find objectionable in that book. Um, so it's important that we talk our English or language arts teachers through the process so they understand what a challenge is. Like we said, they're on the front uh, front lines with the parents. Um, so they understand that it is a formal process. It's not just a complaint. We don't take books away just because someone doesn't like them. Um, and then also so that we can be prepared, we can ask um, for advanced copies of those suggested or assigned reading lists so we can identify potential challenges. That doesn't mean tell the teacher so the teacher censors their list. Like you shouldn't tell the teacher if that's a book that gets challenged, if they don't already know it, um, unless they ask you. Um, there's a link of the top 100 most challenged uh, YA books um, in the book challenge resources section. So you can access if you want to. The, um, the PDF is clickable. Um, there's also a uh, QR code if you print it out um, so that you can get that clickable linked version. Um, so for student voice, we want to reinforce the connection between free speech and the freedom to read. Um, so this is where we can interview students about banned or challenged books that have meant something to them and have them 
uh, you know, describe what was important to them about Catcher in the Rye or Diary of a Wimpy Kid or um, Confessions of a Wallflower. Um, have them create a video or podcast, uh, or you create a video or podcast of interviews so you can share with your colleagues. Um, and it's fine to get teachers in on that. Because the idea is that we're sharing how meaningful these books are to children, these books that have been taken away from some children to some degree or another. Right? It's not just an intellectual topic. Um, what the ALA is promoting this year is to have students tweet um, their favorite author of a band or challenge book. So there's like a list of all their Twitter handles, um, all of the top 10 authors. Um, so uh, John Green's on there because uh, Searching for Alaska is, again, slash still on the top 10 list. I'm going to encourage student-led book clubs um, uh, to read band books as your oh, sorry, that should say September, as your September reading club theme. So here are our top 10 this year, and you can see John Green's book there again, Eleanor and Parks there again. Um, most of these are on here for some kind of sex, sexuality, homosexuality, gender identity adjacent topic with the exception of Eleanor and Park, which is language, I believe. And, and a lot of these should be familiar um, even if you haven't read them as, as books that get, you know, on these lists a lot. Um, for those of you who have makerspaces, I'm personally a big fan of our makerspace. Um, so one of the things we talked about, um, my mentor librarian and I, is um, hosting a challenge book cover art contest so that we can recover our old books so that they don't have to be weeded because the girl on the front has big hair. Um, also, um, I guess the cover, so you could blur uh, the titles on covers and have kids match cover art and uh, synopses and work on that sort of um, like visual fluency. Um, and lastly, displays. Usually what libraries do for uh, Banned Books Week um, for those challenge to Banned Books is just sort of pull everything you have, put them on a table, add some ALA materials re uh, received in the mail, and Yahtzee. So these are ways to um, make them more interactive. They're both um, augmented or virtual reality uh, activities. So I'm going to take out my headphones and see if you can. Maybe. off the shelf. See, in this book, I'm back. Not along with my dog friends. We are going to a national championship on its best dog ball. But along the way, Griffin and the plan has a problem with the ball. I want to know what's going to happen. So I really do need to come check this out.
All right, sorry guys, I know I'm, I'm running way over time. We lost the sound for a while too. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was hoping that if I took out my headphones that it would, um, it would play the computer audio. No. Oh, I'm not sure how to make it do that then. Um, so those are both um, different ways to attach either a, a book trailer video or an audio talk um, using an app to the physical item of a book or the photo of the book cover. Um, and you can create those as librarian. You can have um, classes try that. You can have individual students if you've got a library club. Um, and there are also just tons already, uh, especially book trailers on YouTube that you could attach. So we do that for all of our Blue Bonnet Award books. All right, awesome. Um, well, that thank you very much. Um, I've got uh, a whole bunch of references. Um, thank you so much for being with me. I know I ran over. Um, if you have any questions um, or comments or anything I didn't cover that you think would be um, especially relevant, I would love to hear it. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Heather. You had some great ideas that I think everybody could utilize. Thank you. So